Our next uh, speaker uh, is uh, Piero Poli. He is the general manager of Havas Div Digital in, in the Middle East. Uh, after spending some time with the Havas Digital team in the Middle East in 2011, uh, Piero saw the energy and the passion of the business and the people in the Middle East and the potential for digital to be at the forefront of world best marketing communica communication efforts for brands in the region. Um, he has taken the role of general manager for Havas uh, in the Middle East uh, and is based in Dubai, Dubai as of the 1st of February 2011. He has worked in the digital arena for 12 years and has led digital strategy and creative teams across the automotive, luxury, entertainment, healthcare, and FMCG uh, sectors in Australia, the UK, Switzerland, and Spain. A very international speaker indeed. So let us welcome Mr. Piero Poli. Hello everyone. Um, in the next 20 minutes, hopefully I'm going to be able to inform and inspire you all a little bit about what's happening in the Middle East and mobile. As opposed to presenting case studies of things that have happened in the past, I'm going to present some eye candy of future case studies uh, that we will be uh, showing. Uh, some things that we're launching with clients now, you'll be some of the first people outside of those clients to see those. And they're smart, innovative ways that we're using mobile across the purchase channel for um, our clients. Uh, let's do some number stuff first because this is kind of the important hygiene stuff that we all need to go into clients and say, yeah, tick the box, there's lots of people using mobile all over the place, but this stuff is important. Um, there are parallels. I think it was Manny that was speaking about the, the, the importance of young people picking up mobile here in the Philippines. And fundamentally, these are the future brand uh, consumers, or consumers for brands, should I say. Um, this is happening very much in the Middle East as well. There are insane levels of mobile penetration in the Middle East, and the percentages go over 100% because people have multiple uh, uh, phones up to three in Saudi Arabia, and their rate of changing the phones over is relatively short. It's uh, 12 to 18 months. Um, it's part of the Middle Eastern culture. I'm not going to go through the numbers because you can read those yourself, but just want to give you some insights. I've been in the Middle East now for a year. Incredibly fascinating market. Um, the Middle East really is KSA and uh, the UAE. Sorry if anyone from the Middle East is in the room. But uh, in relation to consumption markets and level of brand and advertising spending, these are the really two big markets. Um, the really interesting cultural insight that you gain very quickly about the Middle East is that mobile fits very comfortably into the type of consumer, cultural consumer we have in the Middle East. It is defined by a society which is a little bit more insular and is a little bit more, uh, a little bit less likely to be extrovert, open and uh, um, to show off it. So the mobile device for the Middle East consumer is their window into the world. It's their functional window, it's their informational window, it's their entertainment window. Um, it's incredible. I think it was Nick that said, you know, having a mobile app is not a mobile strategy. And I could not agree more with that statement. The incredible thing we find in the Middle East is that you could almost launch any app into that market and it has an amazing rate of uptake and uh, use. And I think a lot of that is culturally driven. And there's a few stats on uh, uh, use of applications in a couple of slides. Um, as I mentioned, uh, insane rates of, of penetration, but also numbers of devices owned by people and tablets, surprise, surprise, uh, are growing incredibly quickly as well. Now, tablets are super important. This is one of the bits of eye candy and sneak previews that I'm going to show you. Faces is fundamentally the Sephora of the Middle East. I'm sure you're all familiar with the brand Sephora, the Louis Vuitton brand, which is a brand we also do a lot of work for. Um, just a bit of a disclaimer alert. Uh, we tend to do a lot of luxury work in the Middle East, as you can imagine. So for the Sephoras, the Chanel's, the Dior's of the world, and they're aggressively moving into mobile. It used to be an incredibly scary area for these luxury brands. I've worked for luxury brands now globally for quite a few years and digital just scares the hell out of them because they can't control it like a magazine ad. 
They can control the DPS, the double page spread, or the gatefold in a, in a magazine. They know exactly the magazine it's going in, who the advertiser before them and after them will be. They know the, you know, the, the depth of color in the ad and exactly how it's going to look. And it's going to look the same every single time. But for luxury brands on digital, the, the, the biggest challenge is how the hell do I get this sense of control? Luckily for now, and it's been touched on by a lot of our presenters, we're now getting the formats to enable control um, uh, for that. And we're seeing a lot of aggressive investment, especially from the likes of brands, the usual suspects, Neta Porte, which is one of our uh, global clients, but also uh, Burberry, uh, the, uh, the, the people most people talk about. But interestingly enough, the really conservative fashion houses like Chanel are also doing amazing things. Uh, we don't have an internet connection. There is a, a Chanel example that uh, we did uh, a little while ago that you can when you have a look at the presentation, click, because we've, we've hosted it online and you can still have a look at it. Um, I digress. This is uh, Faces. Now, Faces came to us with a, a really interesting challenge, basically, get me digital um, now. And uh, so before we dived into what we were going to do for them, we were looking at what consumers, what consumer trends are and how their business will be built moving forward. And one of the big trends is e-commerce and internet enabled, uh, uh, um, mobile enabled uh, commerce. So we said to Faces, we should have also a standalone mobile site for you. We said, we don't have the money. And we said, that's fine, because what we can do in the interim is this is the, the site that will go live uh, in, in about a month's time from now, which is their, their, their website. Um, and then we use very fundamental, simple, responsive design techniques. We didn't build them a uh, mobile website. We built them a website which was mobile enabled. And there are certain benefits of that. There are efficiency benefits and there are cost benefits of doing that. So the page fundamentally renders the same on a device through responsive uh, design to ensure that the brand is still presented in the right way and those benefits of future e-commerce behavior can still be driven um, on the mobile device. Um, so it's a, a piece of work that you'll see like if you go to facesme.com, I think the URL is in about a month, you can, you can have a play with it yourself. Um, this is about apps fundamentally and uh, penetrations of handsets. I mean, I'm not going to bore you uh, with the numbers uh, because you can read them yourselves. I think the interesting thing here for us as marketers is to say the case for mobile is clearly proven in the Middle East. I think it's clearly proven in a lot of markets. And here in the Philippines, I think it's a, an, an easy, it should, the default position is mobile works. It's about how brave are you going to be in that mobile space. And applications can be a very easy entree into that space. The easiest clearly is mobile advertising. And I think there is still value and there is still a lot of unexplored territory in relation to the pure online ad space for reach, awareness, consideration, driving, driving consumers through your purchase funnel. But applications as a deeper engagement level, um, you know, there's an app for that. We all know the, the cliche. There is still, if it is based on a consumer insight, which is valid and drives value for you, then an app can be incredibly beneficial. It's not up in, the, uh, in my presentation, but there's a, a peculiar reality with beauty brands in, in uh, Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia... Um, beauty advisors, so the people that are in stores like Sephora and uh, Faces, cannot be women. They have to be men. The majority of the, the vast majority of the consumers for these stores are women. Women don't talk to men they don't know in KSA society at, at, at a level of social and cultural respect. This poses a problem for brands such as brands that we work at because the part, part of the beauty buying process for these women is the exploration and understanding and what's the latest colors and what's the latest trends and tell me about that. They're not gonna go to a guy for that, right? They're gonna go to other women for that. So we identified this and we built an app for, uh, for this particular luxury brand. This is a very high-end French luxury brand. Um, we built them an app which was uh, fundamentally a 
lookbook for their cosmetics that adapts itself depending store on store based on the product that's in that store for that app. Yeah, so if you go into one Sephora store as opposed to a face as opposed to something else, it updates itself. It's based on the product range in there and then it creates looks for these women. So women are downloading using that, uh, they will be using it in their, in their homes and in store. So the interaction with the beauty advisor at the end will be simply, can you please give me this makeup? I need to create these looks and can you just put, you know, can you go and grab that off the shelves for me and do that? So apps, and it's fundamentally an app, that's, that's what it is. Um, however, it's an application based on a business problem and a consumer insight that can be solved well through mobile and application. And I think that's the, uh, the, the, the key point, or the, the key challenge I think sometimes uh, we have as, uh, as mobile experts is to not just think of the default option, but to really say, what problem am I solving with this? How do I get as high up the strategic thinking and problem solving for my client, and how does mobile deliver against that problem? Um, Lots of big numbers again. We always say a lot of big numbers in, uh, in mobile, and here's some more of them. Huge rates of growth. Egypt's going to be an incredibly interesting market if thing, when things start settling down. Um, high rates of mobile penetration in MENA, clearly usage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then we come to the bit which is, yeah, so given all this, why aren't we spending? Now, this is a really interesting thing. I think Nick brought it up. I think some of the other speakers brought it up about the role of SSS. I think Kieran mentioned it as well, or was one of his questions. 85% um, of all the ad spend still in MENA is, is SMS marketing, which is interesting. Um, the total amount spent on mobile is small, and the vast amount of that is spelled, still spent on SMS marketing. Why? It's two ways to look at it. Because it works, or it's because what client, that's what clients are comfortable with, and it's cheap, okay? I've never received more spam messages on my mobile phone since 1994 in Australia than I have since moving to the Middle East. And, okay, sample size of one, I hate them, okay? I, can't, I think they're intrusive, they're untargeted, and I've never signed up for one of them. Okay, SMS can be a really, really powerful tool if the consumer has opted into it, okay? If there's permission behind it. The permission marketing rules within the Middle East aren't as strong as they are in the United States, or in particular, um, the EU. Uh, they will hopefully get there uh, one day. This is the Chanel example that you'll be able to click on. Um, and I think everyone's spoken to this uh, from various uh, perspectives. I think Fook uh, really uh, uh, highlighted this, that you know, it's, mobile is not a channel. It sits at the heart of the way that we are all changing as consumers and our behaviour. It naturally integrates. You know, always uh, one very smart marketer said to me when I was really young, the hardest thing you can ever do in marketing, Piero, is try to change someone's behaviour. The smartest thing you can do is see a behavior which already exists and capitalize on that, make it a little bit easier, make it a little bit more entertaining. So fundamentally what mobile does is it fits into the natural behaviors that we have as consumers, okay? It doesn't force us to do anything different. The dumb advertisers are trying to force us to do different things on mobile because suddenly we have to go there and download an app and blah, 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 blah. But some of them just make it beautifully simple or engaging or entertaining, like the orange example that we just saw. So if we look at really simple, and these are global uh, stats about time spent and um, dollars spent on various mediums, this is how it uh, kind of breaks down. Overinvestment in print, overinvestment in TV, underinvestment on the internet, underinvestment on radio, but I don't know. I, I've never done a lot of radio advertising. Maybe that's not a bad thing and uh, massive underinvestment, given the stats that we all know on uh, mobile. It's a real shame I can't click through and show you this. Um, mobile is an ad platform, uh, mobile is an advertising channel, mobile is an application channel, mobile is a, another way that I can get my website in front of people. Mobile is all of those things, fundamentally. Um, this is a really nice format that uh, one of our global partners uh, in Mobi um, has recently launched in the Middle East, and it inspired actually the central thought for the creative idea for one of our biggest clients in the Middle East. It's really, really simple. Go and play with this because it's awesome. Um, you click on the banner ad, and this is all advertising, okay? 
it's all in banner advertising. So you click on the banner ad, and what happens on your mobile phone screen is that, in this case, Nick, Nick Grimshaw, I don't know how many people, I didn't know of Nick before this, but he's a popular radio personality. Um, Nick calls you, and he starts talking to you on the phone. Clearly, it's a pre-recorded message, but the usability is seamless. You click on it, and literally, this guy's calling you. His face comes up, Nick's, Nick Grimshaw. You answer the call, and he goes, Hi, it's Nick here. Just wanted to give you a call to let you know that my new radio show is going to... You know, I've, clearly, I've listened to this a million times. Blah, 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 blah. Um, then it resolves into uh, this uh, overlay. Not overlay, uh, uh, takeover, uh, where it, it drives different actions. If you don't answer it and decline, the only thing that's different is Nick doesn't talk to you. So uh, you, can still follow <laughs> you can still follow the show, you can like the show, you can visit the website, etc. Um, the great thing is this will be a media first for us in the Middle East, uh, thanks to our partner who's launched the technology. But in our brainstorming session with our creative team and our planning team, when one of our clients who has just spent a ridiculous amount of well-spent money though on associating one of the Middle East's most famous uh, celebrities to their brand for next year. And they were like, how the hell are we going to leverage this for the whole year? Okay. So um, I can't tell you too much because it's still kind of secretive. But anyway, um, what we're going to do is uh, use her voice throughout the year to have an ongoing conversation with people about all the really, really cool stuff she's doing throughout the year for the brand. So she's uh, she's going to um, manage uh, or, or, or curate a fashion show. She's going to do tea for uh, underprivileged women in, in KSA. She's going to do a whole heap of things in this space of beauty and femininity, etc., etc. So we basically, uh, we've got her for a day. We're going to sit her down in front of a recorder. And we go, like, here are your 18 scripts. And you just talk through these. And then throughout the year, we use banner advertising to get people, to get this person to call those people, yeah, directly, and say, hey, I just wanted to, is that my, your time's almost up, Beep? Huh? No? No, it's all right. Um, so <laughs> we're going to get, you know, she's going to have an ongoing conversation every month that's going to feel fresh, okay? We can use media really effectively to drive the uh, audience to get her to call her again and again. We're also using banners interactively so she can call a friend of yours and she could call your dad. We've also got messages set up where she can call you on your birthday. Hey, you thought I'd forgot. I just really wanted to wish you a happy birthday. Have you, I hope you have an amazing day. Okay, that's simple. We record the message once and we use, um, we deliver it through mobile in a really, really simple and engaging way. And we've built a whole ecosystem around it. You know, brands like ecosystems and I think it's important. There are, there's mobile peppered throughout it and it plays a role that's relevant throughout it. But so is Unpack. So is online video, so are social sharing elements, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's the stuff I really wanted to talk about. And, and there's one thing on this slide that uh, more than anything else, uh, I, I've come from the creative side of the business and now I'm on the kind of media creative side. The one thing I love about the media side of the business is metrics, hard data about stuff that works and works really, really, really well. And I know Nick is saying we're there with metrics, but I challenge to say we've got a long way to go with metrics. I think there are a certain level of metrics that give a certain level of comfort to advertisers and to our brands, but it's not deep enough for them yet. And I think our biggest challenge is, is, uh, with our partners, uh, whether they be ad networks or our data partners or our handset providers or network operators, um, is to come up with a common lexicon, a common shared understanding of what those metrics are and uh, use those to drive not, a, not only benefit for the brand, uh, but benefit for the whole mobile ecosystem. Um, thank you. And that's shukran, which is uh, thanks in Arabic at the back. So thank you very much.